Ingram. This is the Ingram Angle. We do have a phenomenal show for you tonight. You're not going to want to miss one minute. President Trump fires back against his critics of his Russia meeting. We're going to analyze all aspects of the media meltdown straight ahead. Also, special counsel Bob Mueller is making some curious immunity requests. Hmm. Is this just a propaganda ploy? We'll break it down. Raymond Arroyo is here tonight with our weekly Seen and Unseen segment, where a political comic is in big time hot water and a former president is attacking his own sex. Plus, the Democrats' true plan for the border. Their votes today tell a very sad tale. Details ahead, but first, the anatomy of a freakout. That's the focus of tonight's angle. Ever since the president misspoke on Monday at the Helsinki summit, the media have spun around like whirling dervishes. They're giddy with excitement. Excitement, of course, that's masked in faux outrage. Never has so much been made of so little. Dan Coates came to me and some others. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. Now, those words set off a chain reaction of condemnation without context. You have been watching perhaps one of the most disgraceful performances by an American president uh, at a summit in front of a Russian leader, uh, certainly that I've ever seen. You should call this the Surrender Summit. Oh, so catchy. Former CIA director John Brennan tweeted, Donald Trump's press conference performance in Helsinki rises to and exceeds the threshold of high crimes and misdemeanors. It was nothing short of treasonous. John Brennan says treasonous. Uh, are we talking, at least from your perspective, I assume from his perspective, impeachment? Well, I'll let that uh, stand uh, as it is as to the responsibilities of the Congress of the United States. Don't you miss Chuck Hagel? By Monday afternoon, there were preposterous calls for the CIA and national intelligence directors to resign in protest. Not against the president's actions, substantive policies toward Russia, but resign over his comments at the press conference. Should the director of national intelligence, Dan Coats, resign in protest? How does Gina Haspel stay in the job? How does Dan Coats stay in the job? By Tuesday morning, the media freakout was evolving into totally uncharted territory. It was like the Bermuda Triangle. People who peddle Trump hatred for a living, and they make a good living at it, they try to outdo one another, jockeying for the, for the uh, poll position and their denunciations and prescriptions. It was, hmm, what's the word? Extraordinary. We all know that Vladimir Putin is holding something over Donald Trump. We do not know what it is. Uh, but we know it must be something extraordinary. I would say, actually, what, it, what it, the definition it meets is the first word of the impeachment article in the Constitution, which is treason, bribery, and high crimes and misdemeanors. We don't know whether what we're seeing is dementia, psychopathy, compromise, but what we're seeing is extraordinary. Do they all get together and pick? This is the multisyllabic word we're going to use today. Extraordinary. You know what's extraordinary? The high dudgeon responses to what was essentially an error of communication. The president reiterated his support of his intel community, and he tried to clarify his comments on Tuesday. Well, then there was this from a cabinet meeting today, which began hmm, with an unfortunate mini ad lib. Is Russia still targeting the U.S., Mr. President? Thank Press, you let's go. Make There's been no president ever as tough as I have been on Russia. I think President Putin knows that better than anybody, certainly a lot better than the media. He understands it, and he's not happy about it. And he shouldn't be happy about it, because there's never been a president as tough on Russia as I have been. Okay, when he said no, that little no you could hardly hear, that only threw kerosene on the media fire, which in turn lit up today's press briefing. Do you have any sense why the president has not been more critical of Putin? Why won't he criticize Putin by name? When he was beside him on Monday, though, why wasn't he critical of Vladimir Putin's actions? Why should this president have any credibility to Americans in what he says? Don't you love the media figures talking about someone else's credibility at this point? The president's offhand remarks were, let's face it, some self-inflicted wounds. 
But the rabid media, Democrats, under attack, issue a subpoena, not only for the translator and the notes, but also for the national security team. If they don't drag the translator in, they have to find out the answers from the Secretary of State, but they have to find the answers out for not only Ambassador McCall, but, but what else was discussed in that meeting? It's frightening. We rewrite the Constitution and have another president take over right now. Oh my God, people actually get paid to say things like that. It is stunning. Okay. We're going to get right on the rewriting the Constitution part. Mounting an overthrow of a duly elected president. You kind of start hearing the rumblings of that there. The left has no record to run on. Certainly not in the midterms. What have they accomplished? Zero. They can't go to the voters and say, this is our prescription for making your life better. We're going to bring you to 4% economic growth. This is what we're going to do to hold China accountable on trade. This is what we're going to do to have a stronger border. They want to abolish ICE, for goodness sakes. So what they do is they seek to create another narrative, that the president is somehow like secretly working behind closed doors to advance Russia's agenda, and that he's at odds with his own intelligence chiefs. This is patently absurd, and I think they know it is. Now, granted, the president has occasionally been inartful in the way he's explained his position. And sometimes his frustration with the Mueller investigation has gotten the better of him. But when you cut through all the theatrical displays of outrage, Trump in many ways is saying what he's always said, even if no one wants to hear him out. I'll go along with Russia. It could have been China. It could have been a lot of different groups. I think it, well, could have been Russia, but I think it could, well, on the next screen, you already know what it's going to have said, have been other countries. Donald Trump, in his heart of hearts, is not convinced that Russia meddled in the election. Oh, take a breath, Chris. That's not what he said historically or this week. The president is saying that Russia is responsible for meddling and that they are not alone. Now, I'm the first to call the president out when he's imprecise in his language, and he has been. Communications are vitally important on a matter as important as this, especially with this Mueller cloud that continues to hang over his head. But saying that Russia is not the only foreign power seeking to tamper with our elections, cause havoc in our society, is neither treasonous nor erroneous. In fact, it is correct. Just listen to the director of national security, Dan Coats. Every day, foreign actors, the worst offenders being Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, every day they are penetrating our digital in infrastructure and conducting a range of cyber intrusions and attacks against targets in the United States. Now, you hear that? Russia is one of many foreign actors trying to disrupt things in the United States. Across the board, every day, incoming from these other countries. That does not rule out the presence of other foreign actors. But perhaps the most egregious and revealing of all the lunatic, get him in the rubber room reactions regarding Trump Russia, once again comes from the former CIA chief, John Brennan. The man, I'm sorry to say, I know it sounds uncharitable, is a complete embarrassment, spewing outrageous falsehoods while offering reckless advice. Would there be a tendency for intelligence gatherers, briefers, to withhold now some vital intelligence to the president? There very well might be. There, there might be out of concern. He went on to expand on that. But yeah, the, out of concern that the White House or the president what, would, would run to Sergei Lavrov or, or Putin himself? Think about that. This is the guy who headed up the CIA. By the way, the same one, I believe, who signed off on the unmasking without a warrant. He's essentially urging current intel officers or giving basically tacit approval to their concealing key national security information from the country's current commander in chief. Shame on you, sir. That is tantamount to a slow rolling coup. So we've gone from charges of treason within minutes of, frankly, of what President uh, Trump said in Helsinki, to calls for resignations, to now former intel chiefs encouraging traitorous acts, acts against the current duly elected president of the United States. It is stunning. The so next time you pundits and hosts want to see a disgraceful and extraordinary and treasonous moment, 
Just pull up some of your TV appearances on the DVR and hit play. And that's the angle. Joining me now for reaction is Dan Bongino, a former Secret Service agent and host of the Dan Bongino podcast, and Juan Williams, co-host of FNC's The Five. Great to have both of you on. Juan, um, look, the president, I think, had a couple of rough communication days, yeah. but I say actions speak louder than words, uh, and the media reaction has been, it reminds me of like the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. They're the, <laughs> they, you know, Trump is a roadrunner, and everybody, they think, okay, I got the TNT now, and we're going to get him, and then Trump just speeds away. But your reaction? Well, I think the big hole in, in the Ingram angle tonight is the Republican response, Laura, that, you know, your fellow Republicans, people who are strong Trump supporters. Here I'm thinking of Newt Gingrich. I'm thinking of people in the Congress who have been slow to offer any objection to President Trump have come out and said, what he did was objectionable and not in service to the United States. And their pundits on no, the right. No, they didn't say, whoa, 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 whoa. They did not say treasonous. Newt Gingrich I tweeted out, treasonous. as did I, as did I, that the president needed to clarify his remarks. I said it on Monday yeah, night with Matt Schlapp. Fair. But that's, that's right. fair criticism. It's not yes. saying he, he, you shouldn't brief him on matters of intelligence or imply no. that somehow he's back-channeling information to the former Soviet Union. No, that is so irresponsible for them to say that. No, I think that they're asking legitimate questions about his actions. You say actions count more than words. So we right. look at his actions, and you look at the entirety of that presentation, that not only the press conference, but the later meeting, the, two hour, the earlier two-hour meeting, we still don't know the details. The Russians say it was a great meeting. They apparently think they're military agreements that our own military doesn't know about. Laura, that introduces questions as to, is this president acting as an American to protect us, the American people? So you're, you're, basically, agreeing with, you're basically agreeing with John Brennan then? No, I don't that know. Brennan, that, that, that said, don't, agreeing? Brennan said that, don't tell him. I don't. He's our president, and I respect that. But I'm saying he has opened the door. Nobody else opened the door. He opened the door to these kinds of questions and these rebukes. Dan Bongino, the idea that because Russia goes home, Lavrov and Putin go home, and they make their propagandistic push to their people, big deal. I mean, I keep saying this. I lived there in 1983. The propaganda flows freely in Russia. I don't take Putin at his word in pretty much anything, but the fact that he's saying, oh, this was a great meeting, big deal. Who cares? That doesn't hurt us if he says that. Yeah, this is what they always do, Laura. What's bothering me about this and, and, and Juan's comments um, particularly is, you know, Juan's talking about actions. But Juan, you're ignoring, and listen, Juan, you don't have to agree with these actions, I, and neither does the audience. There are a lot of libertarians out there, Laura, who would prefer a more non-interventionist approach. Oh, I but do. What's, what, what, Juan's, what Juan's being a little bit, I think, naive about here is when you, when you reasonably look at what Trump has done, he's not a politician, okay? Forget the words for a minute. I'm not saying the words are irrelevant. I'm just saying when you look at what's actually happened, combating against the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is a Russian economic necessity, Laura, personally sanctioning friends of Putin, Oleg Deripaska and Rusal. When you look at the attack on the mercenaries in Syria, the Russian mercenaries, again, you don't have to agree with these actions. There are non-interventionists on both sides who don't even agree with them. But suggesting that he's a Russian pawn while his military wipes out Russian mercs, uh, sanctions billionaires who are his buddies, and then cuts off a potential economic lifeline, Juan, is completely unreasonable. Where are you getting this from? But, Dan, wait a minute. In that serious situation you described, remember, the Russians were attacking us. That's why we responded. Right. So I'm just telling right, you. And right, what, no. about, what about Iran and Iran's continued support for terrorism and for uh, Assad in Syria, Iran. contrary to American interest? Juan, did you just say Iran? Did you object when we delivered pallets full of cash? And please don't tell me it was oh their gosh. money because neither is, President Jimmy Carter or no, no, can, this is not a distraction. You're the conversation. No, no, I'm not. I, don't wanna, because, I think you disagree, and I disagree with you about the Iranian nuclear deal, but that's not what we're talking about. We're yeah. talking about Iranian interference in Syria contrary to American interests. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, no, I get it, Juan, and that's, I, I understand that. But yeah. Juan, we have not been a friend to the Iranians either. I don't understand in yeah, Syria well, what it, well, I don't know, I'm missing well, look, what the point is. Guys, we, guys, we wiped out Russian mercenaries and we're combating the Iranians yeah, in well, Syria. Look, the, What's the, the point? I mean, actions versus verbal missteps or miscues or ad-libs or asides. 
It's legitimate to criticize the communication uh, uh, push after Helsinki. I, I, I'm fine with that. But jumping to these other conclusions, I think it, it, it takes it to another level. The New York Times is just reporting that um, Trump was handed documents two weeks before the inauguration right. indicating that Putin personally ordered the hack into the United States. It just literally dropped in the New York Times. We'll have to unpack all of that. But uh, Juan, look, th this, this is where we are. The president gave an interview tonight to CBS News, to, to Jeff Glor, where he talked about and tried to, again, clarify this point about the intelligence chiefs and who's responsible. Let's watch. You say you agree with U.S. intelligence that Russia meddled in the election in 2016. Yeah, but, and I've said that before, Jeff. I have said that uh, numerous times before. And uh, I would say that that is true, yeah. Your reaction very quickly. Juan. I think it's like a guy trying to clean up after the circus. It's, it's, it's futile. I mean, Americans saw it wasn't just verbal missteps, as you describe it. I think the whole meeting with Putin and the fact that we still don't know uh, is an indication that Pete, something is strange here. And it, 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 I think for all of us, for you, for Dan, for me, it's got to wonder, why is our president behaving in such a way as to introduce these questions? And that's why I said to you, Laura, it's not just Democrats. It's not just some crazed liberals, uh, pundits. They're Republicans, your fellow Republicans, who are raising these very legitimate questions based on his words and his actions. I think there are a lot of Republicans who never really wanted Trump in the first place. There are a few others, but the majority of the Republicans who think this is the be-all and end-all story of the, of the last five years are not people who generally agree with his more nationalist foreign policy or economic policy. But uh, great conversation as always, guys. Thanks so much. Now, we've seen some rather interesting political alliances emerging in recent days with former presidents speaking out more than ever. If the U.S. takes the lead, others tend to follow. Do you really want to say, we're going to make everybody have a big military, but we're not going to help anybody build their own future and change their own lives? You've got far-right parties that oftentimes are based not just on platforms of protectionism and closed borders, but also on barely hidden racial nationalism. Are we seeing a new kind of political paradigm being created in the age of Trump? Joining us now to analyze this and the breaking news out of the New York Times is Carl Rove, former senior advisor to President George W. Bush. Carl, it's great to have you on the show tonight. I think it's the first time on the Ingram Angle, so thanks so much for coming on. Uh, what, thanks for what, having me. what about that? You had just in the last couple of weeks, you had, or last week, you had Obama, Clinton, and George W. Bush, all not directly referencing the president, but clearly, there are not so thinly veiled references to his governing style and his, the substance of his policies. Your reaction to yeah. that? Well, look, uh, uh, President Clinton and President Bush 43 were uh, speaking at a uh, seminar in Little Rock for the Presidential Scholars, a program that they and the President 41, Bush 41 Library and the LBJ Library have. I don't uh, see that that was anything other than just simply responding to questions and talking about their views on, uh, for example, leadership. Of, it, it, President Bush made the point that uh, it, it, the world depends upon American leadership. When America leads, the world tends to follow. Uh, President Obama's speech, I read it at length. It's, 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 it's a typical Obama performance, very long. Um, there are parts of it that, that appear to be directed at uh, President Trump. But there's a bunch of it that I think has got to be put in the context of he's appearing in South Africa. He is being hosted by Nelson Mandela's widow. He is giving the Mandela lecture. And he is in the presence of the new president of South Africa who has come to, uh, to office uh, only after uh, a, a huge conflict inside South Africa over a corrupt predecessor who uh, was exactly what President Obama described in his speech as a strong man who, under, who demolished the institutions of, uh, within South Africa and engaged in sort of crony capitalism and undermined a sense of democracy. Had an election, but it was clearly, yeah. uh, you know, uh, it was clearly phony and uh, he was heralding, uh, it's, a, it's an unusual speech because at one point he talks about in South Africa the importance yeah. of markets. Uh, but it's a, it's, it, there are points that clearly. Yeah, in which it was he's, wild. It was wild. Carl, hold that, hold that thought. You're going to stay with us more on the
because he's in charge of the country, just like I consider myself to be responsible for things that happen in this country. So certainly, as the leader of a country, you would have to hold him responsible, yes. What'd you say to him? Uh, very strong on the fact that we can't have meddling, we can't have any of that. I let him know we can't have this, we're not going to have it, and that's the way it's going to be. Now, that was President Trump earlier tonight, hours before this report broke from the New York Times, essentially saying that the president was told that Putin did personally call for the hacking into our elections. Karl Rove is back with us. He's joined by Richard Goodstein, a Democratic strategist and policy expert. Saul Weisenberg is the former deputy independent counsel during Whitewater. Carl, I had to rudely interrupt you before we broke for a commercial. What's your reaction to this New York Times report? It frankly doesn't really surprise me because Brennan was pretty much on to this Russia uh, behind the meddling six months earlier, from, from what I could tell. So it doesn't really surprise me that the president would be briefed on this. Yeah, look, no, it doesn't surprise me either. And, and frankly, remember early in the administration, I think the president had a line that I wish he had used on Monday, which is he said early in his term that, of course, uh, he would like to know if anybody meddled in an American election and, and because he would want to uh, make certain that it was stopped. And I, I wish the president had that tone on Monday. But no, this, this latest report doesn't surprise me. What, what did surprise me was the ability of the Mueller investigation and our, our government's uh, cyber forensics to be able to identify the specific actors, 12 actors sitting. Can you imagine those guys sitting in their office in the GRU and, uh, and going online and seeing their names and, figure, and asking the question of how could they tell it was us? Yeah, and Saul, I want to ask you specifically about that, that indictment that dropped last Friday. One indictment, 12 Russian GRU and other officers. Um, what of that? What, to me, I thought, why name them? Why not keep that under seal and actually try to see if maybe one of them comes to the United States? Apparently, some of them maybe have been to the United States. I mean, but what, what's the theory behind that? Well, I don't know what the theory is, but if you don't put them under seal, you know you're never going to get them over right, here. They're, they're, never G, they're GRU officers. And I think uh, the point of the indictment, these people will never appear in the U.S. court. The point of the indictment was to buy Mueller some time and to say, look, I'm really doing things and I'm doing important things. But uh, it, it's really a speaking indictment. And I, I don't doubt that he'll be able to, he, he'll prove that. It's just that he'll never be called on to prove it. And, but indictment for our, our viewers, just to be clear again, an indictment are the charges. You do not yet see all the evidence. Obviously, they wouldn't put it all. A lot of it's very sensitive. But it, they're the charges against these individuals. Absolutely. In people fact, forget that people think when you're indicted, like a lot of people are indicted and they're not they're not guilty. I mean, liberals used to believe that, but not, not saying they're not guilty. That, but yeah. people have to remember, if we're going to blame Trump for not having smart verbiage, we have to be smart with our verbiage, too. Laura, in every criminal case, every criminal case, state or federal, the judge tells the jury the indictment is not proof. The indictment is not evidence. And yet I saw on the other networks constantly here we have the proof. Here we have the evidence. Now, look, if Mueller didn't think he had it, He's perpetrated a massive fraud, and I don't think he has. But, but you know, and Andy McCarthy made the comment that basically now all the Russians are presumed innocent because this has been put into an indictment. But the, the real point is, is this is a this is a speaking indictment meant to buy time for Bob Mueller. Oh, so no Americans named in it, no American actions reference. But nevertheless, it you know it ate up some of the news cycle, and the president apparently, Richard approved the timing, said it was okay to hand down the indictment. I guess they, they checked with the White House, or and he basically said it was okay, which kind of kills the narrative that Trump was, like, worried about the indictments. But your reaction, Richard? Can I react to this New York Times story? What's newsworthy about it is one of two things. Either Trump has no faith whatsoever in the intelligence community, because if he does, just today there's a new, another New York Times story saying, well, I hold Putin responsible in the sense that he's the head of the country, just like people hold me responsible for what goes on here. No. If you were told two weeks before the indictment that Putin personally and directly was sort of overseeing this subversion of the U.S. democracy, that's not, oh, well, he runs the country. No, that's very specific, and Trump still can't acknowledge that. That's troublesome. Well, that's what, but that's what he said tonight when CBS News. That's what Donald Trump said tonight. 
George, that Putin is responsible. I would, he's in charge of the country. Like, I can submit but, a but no, but that's to different. No, that, to say he's well, because responsible because, yeah. because he's in charge of yeah, the country, yeah. it's like saying, oh, we are the managers responsible but, for the team. But this is where Karl Rove, I think, with your experience in the Bush administration, they're playing, I hate the multi-level chess <laughs> reference, but he does have other concerns other than just what's happening in the Mueller investigation, what the New York Times is going to publish. He just had this meeting with Putin. Now, I imagine, and he references today, Carl, they were talking about Israel, uh, Iran, Syria, nuclear non-proliferation, uh, uh, getting back to some semblance of a whatever a normal relationship with Russia is. That does come into play, and Obama references, Carl, back in uh, 2016. He's like, in insulting someone on the world stage, that doesn't accomplish anything. And I don't recall George yeah. W. Bush insulting Putin, uh, whether in Crawford at the ranch or uh, the Clintons when they were meeting, when, yeah. when Hillary was meeting with Lavrov. You don't insult people, even if you know they're trying to mess around with our systems, which they always yeah. have been trying to mess around with our systems. Yeah. Well, look, I, 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 I agree with you. I don't take umbrage. I, President Trump should not have uh, been there for the purpose of slamming uh, President uh, uh, Putin to his face. Uh, nor am I worried about having a, a solitary meeting. President Bush, for example, met, met on a one-on-one, -on -one, literally drove the king of Saudi Arabia around his ranch in Crawford and discussed very important issues. Uh, it, it, I, I, I think that's over, uh, overreach. I do think the president uh, needed to project strength on Monday, and he didn't, by his words. It, it was when he was asked that question, it, he could have answered in a way that would have uh, tr uh, Putin would have known that he was that he was upset about it and know and knew that the Russians were behind it, but it could have been straightforward and strong without being insulting. And uh, uh, the president didn't hit that note on on Monday. He did a better job on CBS tonight. Uh, e even that tone would have been fine on Monday. But there's no need for the president to go in and insult world leaders just for the sake of insulting world leaders, particularly if you're trying to find a way forward. There are important things that we need to do. We've got serious questions about the Russians and living up to their existing. Treaty agreements on the intermediate range missile right. uh, treaty. We have a we have uh, a treaty with them negotiated by President Bush that comes up for renewal in 2021 on nuclear weapons. We have concerns about them in that regard. We we I hope the president brought up their their they're not helping us in North Korea. Yeah. Lavrov, as you remember, shows up one week before uh, the, the meeting in Singapore. He shows up in Pyongyang to basically tell the North Koreans, "We got your back." Yeah, don't uh, worry. Stiff the Americans. Yeah, Nivol yeah. in Russia. Nivol Nilyatis. It's going to be okay. But I think the president should give an address to the nation about this. And, and Saul, Richard, uh, Carl, where he talks about our relationship with Russia, basically what they discussed at this meeting and what could be improved without no Mueller reference, no <laughs> Peter Strzok reference, none of that. But give an address to the nation. Uh, a fantastic panel, guys. Thank you so much. I know it was short tonight with all this breaking news. Uh, by the way, Sasha Baron Cohen could be in legal hot water. Oh, goody. Speaking of legal problems. And will a movie about Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg do her legacy any justice? Raymond Arroyo brings that all to us in Seen and Unseen. Start. It's time now for our Seen and Unseen segment, where we expose what's behind the big cultural stories of the day. He calls himself a comedian, Sasha Baron Cohen, and he pranked everyone from Sarah Palin to Ted Koppel. But could his stunts now land him in legal trouble? For more, we're joined by Fox News contributor, New York Times bestselling author of the Will Wilder series, Raymond Arroyo. Raymond, Cohen's new show, Who is America, premiered this weekend, but the real question is, I want to know, is who the heck is watching? Not too many people. It premiered with only 327,000 total viewers. That's point one in the demo. If you had those ratings, you would probably go into retirement. Right well, I'd be at in 3, well, 3 a.m. I get those ratings. Well, I, I don't even think you get them at 3 a.m. Yeah. I think you get more than that. Yeah. But here's, here's the point. Though Cohen was able to snooker people like Dick Cheney, Sarah Palin, and others, there was a Riverside, California gun shop owner whom when Cohen walked in, his name was Norris Sweden, the gun shop owner, he saw through Sasha's charade early on. Watch. I just kept looking at the guy and I was like, you're Borat. Soon as I said that, his eyes just looked at me like, and he did a B turn right out the door. Once I knew it was Borat, we already know his game and his So we knew that he's here to make a mockery and make a mockery of what? Gun owners, the gun business, gun shops. 
he did make a mockery of gun owners and gun activists. He got some of them to read a script teaching children how to use firearms. Again, it's to embarrass people who own guns, who like guns. And uh, Cohen, had... by the way, was dressed as a Hungarian immigrant there with a beard. He looked like a runaway from he... Duck Dynasty. Duck Dynasty, I was just <laughs> going to say he looked like Duck Dynasty. Maybe, but that, that, that no, no, no. Was, but I love the old, the they, 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 they make fun of the good old boys. Like the good old boys are dumb. And that good old boy saw, saw right, right through, through that lame costume. And in little Freddy Cat, instead of standing there trying to do some uh, original stand-up, he should have turned it into a joke. But instead, he ran out. Well, what a little And then wuss. there's this charge of Total that, that he's stolen valor. In fact, there was some billboards around L.A. about this. The problem with the Stolen Valor Act of 2013 that some think yeah. applies to Cohen because he impersonated a, a, a war veteran, it doesn't apply. You have, it's about wearing the medal, a false yeah. medal. That's what's the illegal. I think he's impersonating, impersonating a comedian myself. But <laughs> there's a new Ruth Bader Ginsburg biopic. Ooh. Ooh. You're, you're already got your tickets, I'm don't ready, you? ready, ready. On the, and it's called On the Basis of Sex. That's just, it's, is that the joke? Okay. No, that's not uh, it. It's coming under fire for potential inaccuracies. What are they? Well, first of all, Portraying Ruth Bader Ginsburg is an actress named Felicity her. Jones. I'll put up a picture of them okay. side by side so you can compare. Do you think this evokes Ruth Bader Ginsburg? I'll leave it to the audience. But the bigger, <laughs> but the bigger problem, it's the doily both, that's off. They're if, both beautiful in their yes, own way. Yes, but if Felicity Jones had the doily, it would be better. Ruth Bader Ginsburg the, is one of the nicest people. Do you know I spent New Year's Eve with her in 1986? Uh, this isn't a walk down memory lane in the court. i got to get to a segment okay. here. Okay, here's what happened. They played a trailer of this movie. They've released it. And legal scholars are going crazy. Watch this. Okay. You think you can change the country? You should look to her generation. They're taking to the streets. Protests are important, but changing the culture means nothing if the law doesn't change. What did you say your name was? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The word woman does not appear even once in the U.S. Constitution. Nor does the word freedom. Your Honor. So the word freedom doesn't appear in the Constitution? I ask you, Lord. First Laura Amendment, Ingram. isn't it? Yeah, it's Let's in the First that. Amendment. <laughs> what? Okay. Now, the, the, the screenwriter, who is also Ruth Bader Ginsburg's nephew, surprise, surprise, he says it, what, she's, it, what she's pointing to is the Constitution as it was originally adopted before the Bill of ah. Rights. And that that's why she says freedom doesn't appear in the original Constitution. This is like wooden or wood. Or, but they're making fun of Trump for All that. I can say is when they cast my life story, I want somebody as pretty as <laughs> Felicity pretty. Jones to, you know, well, to speak, play speaking, by the my way, significant of, other I, or me. See, she... Speaking, oh, you're going to, uh, I guess, do this next well, thing. Okay, I'll do this. Okay. Speaking of gender politics and equality, Barack Obama in Johannesburg spoke out against his own sex today. Uh, Watch. Men have been getting on my nerves lately. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, uh, every day I read the newspaper and I just think, like, brothers, what's wrong with you guys? I mean, what's wrong with us? Right? He told I mean, we're, we're violent, we're bullying. Violence and bullying. The idea. This men is like, cannot. Men are like no, just targets. This I'm is sorry. like toxic masculinity. That term that's become oh, so yeah. popular now. And then the notion is that masculinity, robust masculinity, leads to bullying or assaults upon women. You know what leads to assaults upon women? Men who are not taught to be gentlemen. That's the problem. And all these studies now coming out about the gender inequality in certain industries like film. They did a study. Film review critics, okay? Yeah, they're 68% male. He told as Vladimir Putin. To 32% to female. Well, they say this is why female flicks that have all female casts like Beaches, Oceans like 8. Beaches. Go, no, not that. Ghostbusters, Oceans 8, all the female reboots oh, and yeah. stories. They flop because they get bad reviews bad from movies. all the men. Well, I looked at publishing, an industry I know a lot about. 78% of the people in publishing are women. Oh, good. They, and then they have to equalize it. More men no. have to be hired. I'm going to tell you what. I've worked with a lot of these women. You know why they're there? Not because they're women. Because they're good. They're good. The they're detail-oriented. people should be in these positions. We should not be worrying about gender equity. Bean some people are better in some professions than others. Leave it alone. I think I'm going to get one of those doilies around my, for you know, every night and wear one of those doilies. I never liked the doilies. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor started it and it keeps going. No, no, it keeps I, going I always want to grab, grab a vase and put it, it on top of it. Reminds me of that thing. thing my grandmother always had at the, on the back of the couch. Right, exactly. Uh, those, little... those were never cleaned. <laughs> well. Democrats are shamelessly exposing their new immigration and border security agenda, Raymond. We're going to tell everyone 
Today, the House passed a resolution to support the mission of the officers of ICE by a vote of 244 to 35. If that number seems a little low to you, it's because only 18 Democrats supported the measure. 133 of those brave ones voted present. Profiles and courage. The vote is hardly surprising once you listen to the rhetoric of the new generation of Democratic leaders. Corporations, certain people who get certain rights, can go back and forth across the border seeking out the lowest wages, but people, regular people, cannot go back and forth across the border seeking out the highest wages. So what it creates is an imbalance. It creates an injustice. We have to occupy all of it. We need to occupy every airport. We need to occupy every border. We need to occupy every ICE office until those kids are back with their parents, period. Alexandria loves the word occupy and occupation. We should talk about the Palestinian road occupation. Now it's occupy everything. To discuss the Democrats' real immigration agenda, what this vote tells us is Fox News contributor Rachel Campos Duffy and co-host of The Five, backed by popular demand, Juan Williams, rejoins us. Juan, thanks so much for coming back. Uh, we, uh, we We had a guest who, unfortunately was pulled over by the police on the way to the studio. <laughs> that is live TV at its finest. That's the kind of stuff that usually happens to me. Um, Rachel, look, the Democrats have, I think they've been boxed in a little bit here by the Republicans, probably smartly. But there, there's a, there is a contention that believes it's, it's time to go much bolder on the issue of amnesty and immigration and make it easier for people to apply for asylum. Once you cross the border with a family unit, a judge says you can't deport people right away. So did the Democrats really lose anything with this vote? I don't know, but you talked about being boxed in. I'll tell you, they're being boxed in by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, Republicans often say that a socialist is an honest Democrat, and she is young, she is bold, and she is politically naive enough um, to have told the truth. And for a while, I think her, you know, her ideas, abolishing ICE, um, you know, open borders, socialism, she's openly socialist, all this got the Democrats really excited because her election was so shocking. And they kind of all pulled their masks out for, you know, off for a minute. And, you know, Mark Pocan, who represents Madison in Wisconsin, came out with the bill to abolish ICE. Um, and everyone was really excited. And then they, they pulled it and they realized that the American people um, weren't really with them. So they sort of pulled the punch. So yeah. when the Republicans put this bill forward, um, they all still want to speak to that base that gets everyone excited, the party of Bernie, the party of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And so yeah. they voted present instead of for the bill, which is well, what they really believe, because they really believe in the same things that Alexandria does. Juan, is that the case? You only had 18 Democrats vote to support immigration customs enforcement. You know this just as I do, that they do so much great work on sex trafficking, human trafficking, uh, the assist in the uh, breaking up of these uh, cartel narcotics operations. But only 18 Democrats? Well, remember, I mean, we've only had ICE, I think it's after 9-11, so about 15 years of ICE. And in the view of people on the left, Laura, you know, ICE is implicated in the separation of children from parents and not only that, raiding communities, raiding businesses, making people extremely, extremely nervous about their status here. And, and breaking up families. So then, then reform it. Then reform that's ICE. Right. Don't well, vote that's to right. abolish ICE. But so because what? But the political maneuver here was that the Democrats, and this is the Boxton you were talking about. The Democrats initially said, "Let's vote to abolish ICE." Then the Republicans pulled the bill and then came back with this latest effort, which is, "Let's vote in support of ICE." And so, like both sides are playing right. big politics here. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's listen to what right. some they, of the Democrats. Oh, hold on one second, Rachel. I want you guys to react okay, sure. to what some of the Democrats today we're saying about this ICE issue, immigration enforcement in general. I'm voting present on this resolution because it's a sham and a distraction. It's shameless and it's inappropriate. What we have today is a shameless, spineless group of Republican congressional enablers. You take your marching orders from Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson quicker than the president takes his marching orders from the Kremlin. You are powerful, Laura Ingram. We need it. We need it. We need it. I, 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 I have to jump in there, I Laura. I think I've never I, talked I, about. I don't think I've even talked about this vote. Uh, Tommy can. <laughs> I don't think so, right, Tom? I don't think I've even talked about this vote on the show. I've talked about ICE in general, but yeah. not about the vote. We have. We've been covering other issues, but Rachel, go ahead. 
I just have to jump in because there's all this talk about Russian influence um, going on. But if you really think about it, uh, the real takeover of the Marxists, the socialists, the, the old Soviet Union is on the Democrat Party and on American universities. Uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a product of a Marxist, socialist, anti-American uh, ideology that is permeating um, and, and has for several decades now permeated American higher education and now going even into uh, you know high schools and, and and lower so that's the real concern I have with Russian influence it's on the Democrat Party and on our on our education system well uh, one final word from you I mean Ocasio Cortez did denounce capitalism she uses the lingo Absolutely. of the far left and Marxist the kind of stuff you hear at you know Thursday night seminars at, sure. at well, university uh, you know I think I think people she's the future the of the right, party I think people on the right are really beating her up uh, but she's 28 years old. I don't think she's very so politically sophisticated. But guess what? When it comes to things like health care, education, when it comes to making sure that people have a living wage, most Americans say yes to these things. Well, people yeah, don't she want wants it all families to be separated yeah. by and Most ICE. Americans believe in the rule yeah. of law and that we yeah. should, if you want to reform ICE, you vote for it. You don't occupy. I agree with you um, on You that. don't resist. You know what I'm doing? I'm giving two thumbs up to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Okay, <laughs> she needs to be, just keep going. Keep evolving. Keep changing. Uh, great panel. She's Thanks a so truth much, teller. Guys. Exactly. <laughs> Facebook finally apologizing to Diamond and Silk, but the social media...